LaCie Broadcasting presents live from Studio B. And now, here's your host, Dana Key. How are you folks doing tonight? Doing good? All right, good. I haven't seen you guys in a while. Did you have a good uh, Halloween? I'm not supposed to say Halloween. I'm supposed to say harvest time. Did you have a good harvest time? Did you? That whole harvest Halloween thing throws me off. I'm not exact. I mentioned this last time. I don't, I'm, not, I'm not exactly sure what you're supposed to do. You know, for a long time when we had little kids, we just did a harvest parade. And that was pretty cool because it would get the tricycles out there and give them, you know, uh, candy and things. But, you know, you can't really do that with teenagers because they want to, what, trick or treat, right? So I told my, I told my kids, I told uh, Andrew and Eli, they want to go trick or treat. And I, I felt uncomfortable with that. Do you feel strange about that? So with all the crime especially, you know what I'm saying? They might get something terrible in their bag. So I told them, think of some way you can really honor God and let's do something creative. Because, you know, really, when you have something like, you know, Thanksgiving, it, we honor the fact that God has brought us together as a country and blessed us. And Christmas, we honor the fact that Jesus came to earth as a child and, and, and lived and died for us. And Easter, we celebrate the fact that he resurrected from the dead. And I'm thinking, you know, maybe we should grab a hold of this Harvest Day concept and really find a way to honor God. And so I challenged my boys to do that. And no kidding, this is what they did. I came home from the studio late, and I saw them in the bushes. And we had some trick-or-treaters that were coming up to my door. And they painted a sign, and there was a bowl of candy bars, and it said, Take one. And they had placed one of the walkie-talkies in the bottom of the candy bowl. And when the trick-or-treaters reached down to take their one candy bar, they said, Take one. God is watching you. <laughs> and then the trick-or-treaters ran. We, uh, we had a full bowl of candy all night. It was, it was, and I asked him, I said, you know, I wanted you to be creative. And I, Andrew, what exactly, how were we honoring God with that? And he said, this uh, is going to be a tribute to judgment. <laughs> so I said, oh, well, okay. Now, I got an email this week. And someone asked me, and it was a, it's a legitimate question. They said, Dana, for 20 years you've been singing Christian music or talking about Christian music on your radio show or on your TV show. And, you know, there are more important things to dedicate your life to than Christian music. And, I, you know, I, maybe there are. I mean, there are a lot of important issues a person could dedicate their life to. Well, let me just remind you of, of two things that I came across recently. First of all, did you know that young people today listen to almost 30 hours a week of music? 30 hours? That's like a almost a full-time job of just listening to music. And then the Billy Graham organization says that 80% of people who choose to follow Jesus Christ do it before the age of 21. Now, to me, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to put those two things together. And if you see music as a valuable tool playing a huge role in people's lives, you realize, hey, we can use music as a tool to get these kids before the age of 21, because almost all of evangelism, therefore, is what? Youth evangelism. Because almost everybody trusts Jesus before the age of 21. Is that right? So I see music as an incredible tool. And tonight we have an extremely talented, gifted band, musicians that I personally have followed for a lot of my career. We are truly blessed, ladies and gentlemen, to have with us tonight the Ragamuffin Band. Give them a big hand! Come on! Joseph took his wife and her child And they went to Africa 
To escape the rage of a deadly king There along the banks of the Nile Jesus listened to the song That the captive children used to sing They were singing My deliverer is coming My deliverer is standing by Help us out my deliverer is coming, my deliverer is standing by. Giant thirsty lamb, water from the Kenyan heights pours itself out of Lake Sangra's broken heart. There in the Sahara wind, Jesus heard the whole world cry for the healing that would flow from his own scar everyone the world was singing my deliverer is coming my deliverer is standing by my deliverer is coming my deliverer is standing by he will never break his promise he has written it upon the sky. My deliverer is coming. My deliverer is standing by. My deliverer is coming. My deliverer is standing by. Doubt his promise, though I doubt my heart, I doubt my eyes. My deliverer is coming. My deliverer is standing by. Oh, deliverer is coming. My deliverer is standing by. My deliverer is coming. My deliverer. His promise, though the stars should break faith with the sky. My deliverer is coming. My deliverer is standing by. My deliverer is coming. My deliverer is standing by. My deliverer is coming. My deliverer. Standing by, my 
deliverer is coming. My deliverer is standing. for showing up tonight and you sound great when you sing we'll get into some more of that later I guess um, 
I had the opportunity to go out to Window Rock the weekend before Rich died and uh, to talk to him about the Jesus record and I will forever be grateful that I had that opportunity to see him one last time. We sat down in his Hogan and he played us the song we're about to play for you now. Um, and it was the first song I'd heard for quite a while from the, the record. I'd never heard it before. And I, I just remember sitting there dumbfounded at the, uh, the depth of the lyric, the transparency of it, of a song that dealt so openly with abandonment and isolation and doubt and ultimately the hope that we have in Christ in a way that only Rich could do. That song is called Hard to Get. as yours was Still we do love now and then Did you ever know loneliness? Did you ever know need? Do you remember just how long the night could get? When you were barely holding on and your friends falling don't see the blood that's running in your sweat. Will those who mourn be left uncomforted? While you're up there, just playing hard to get. Cannot get free of what we've 
The size of screen door on a submarine Baby, without words, baby Just ain't happen now One is your left hand and One is your right It'll take two strong arms mm-hmm, To hold up tight Some folks that cut off their nose Just to spite their face But I think you need some works to show You're a legend, big girl There's a difference, you know Ship before you claim to walk on water. Be without work, so like a song you can't say. It's about it's just the size of spring door on a submarine. Because from God, from every word that He breathes, He lets you take it to your heart so you can give it in some beat. It's gotta be active if it's gonna be alive. You gotta put it into practice. Otherwise, it's about it's just the size of screen door on a submarine. Like a song you can't sing It's about as useless as a screen door on a submarine I'm back, your host, Dana Key With Mark Robertson and Rick Elias Explain that clip that we affectionately call the cup song here. What's that all about? Well, I think Mark could answer that better because he's still, he's kind of the leader of it now. He's the well, cup leader. Yeah. It's the real simple song about faith and, uh, and a really hard song to play on a cup. Yeah. <laughs> so we've done it about three, four hundred times and it's never been done right all the way through. <laughs> well, I can see that. To me, you know, like one of my worst fears is that I, the church would persuade me to be in the bell band. You know what I mean? You know what I'm saying? It's like a nightmare that I have, but my bell's out of tune. And every time they get to me, you know, and I smile and I go, and everyone knows it's you. But like in the cup band, you can dare to be stupid and no one really cares because after all, it's not bells, it's cups. All right. Uh, And the the thing is, the more they blow it, the better it is. Actually, (laughs) the the more fun it is. Well, you know, Rick, I have a saying. It's, uh, it's, It's gone through with me through my career and obviously followed me into the show tonight. It's dare to be stupid. Yes. Yes. It's important for us yes. as Christians to dare to be stupid, don't you think? I absolutely agree with that. <laughs> Speaking of stupid, uh, that's a terrible segue into this next question, isn't it? You don't know what it is, but it really is. What's, explain the ragamuffin band name. What's up with that? Well, it came from uh, Brennan Manning's book, The Ragamuffin Gospel. And we had all read the book uh, independently of one another. And uh, Rich, being the visionary, really kind of took this to heart and he was moving into I think a new phase in his career you know of more autonomy and he wanted a band around him that were ragamuffins just as he was and uh, so he formed the ragamuffin band and asked Jimmy and I to to uh, be among the charter members and then uh, Mark and Aaron joined about a year later and uh, it was good it was a good thing it's a you know for those of us who are a little rough around the edges 
You're, you're not insulted by being a charter member of a band called the Ragamuffins? I am honored. You're honored to be yes, a Ragamuffin. Yes, I am honored and I'm proud of All it. All right. Okay. I, I challenged our guests, ladies and gentlemen, to dare to be stupid tonight, and they've come through for me. <laughs> now, on a very serious note, I was cruising through the internet last night, and I, I, I don't like to do this, but I was looking at the sales charts. Mm. And uh, because I just wanted to see where this ragamuffin was coming from, and man, you guys have got a best selling album. And uh, let me see if I can. They, they scream at me because I can't hold these things steady, but is there, is there a camera that can find this album someplace? I'll just trust our highly trained professionals that they can zoom in on this uh, album. Anyway, it's got Jesus on the cross. It's called, very cleverly, <laughs> I like this, it's uh, the Jesus record. It's, it reminds me of Rebecca St. James's God album, yeah. but uh, hey, get to the point. But you know what I'd like for you to do, guys. Maybe start Mark and Rick. Explain to me your take on the album, how it came to pass, what it means to you. It's an unusual record. Yeah, that's a fact. Well, it was really kind of uh, a trick Rich pulled on us in a way. It's that we were all getting kind of, as a lot of people can get when your Christianity is also part of your business. That's what we do for a living. We were getting pretty jaded and weird about the whole thing. And uh, we're called ragamuffins for a very good reason. And it, Rich made it a part of our daily work to write an album called The Jesus Record and perform it. And the only way to do that is to focus on the mind of Christ on a daily basis. It was a part of our work day. And uh, it worked. <laughs> so that was the main So focus. actually, this was something that Rich did is almost therapeutical from the way I hear you saying. Not almost, yeah. Yeah. Just briefly, Mark, I mean, I, you know, I don't think these folks can really fully appreciate I toured for 17 years with DeGarmon Key, so I understand. Oh, yeah. Yo, oh, did no. you? <laughs> well, there are a lot of strange people with us, and uh, that was probably before the uh, hat, but... Um, <laughs> I was wearing a tuxedo at the time. <laughs> yes! I saw you! Okay. But... Uh, just, you know, you don't have to go into the bruising details, but what are the kind, what's the difficulty of merging a, being a Christian with the playing music professional? Well, I mean, I find it frustrating. Rich figured out how to get around it in a, in a way that I found fascinating. But I find the, the kind of Nashville music business thing, it's, I mean, Christianity to me is, is God's grace, and it's that in our weakness he is made strong. If we humble ourselves, he's exalted. And, and that's a, lot, a large part of the gospel. And I need that part of the gospel. I rely on it. And, but when we get into that business side of it, we have to look perfect and, and squeaky clean, and we have no flaws. And if we do, we best not admit to them. Is that what you're going for tonight, Mark? I can, uh, the, I'm sorry. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. That's all right. I wore my sandals tonight. Those are very snappy. Yes, good enough for Jesus, good enough for me is always my saying. But anyway, yeah. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you and you were saying something wonderful. <laughs> That's all right. But you've forgotten what it was now. No, I thought I finished. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> You're done. <laughs> Rick, what's your, what's your take on the album? Tell me how you got involved with it, what parts you played with it. Well, I produced the record. Yeah. Um, and that was only because of the generosity of Rich and, and the, my fellow ragamuffins. I think the, the, the most glaring misconception about the record when we were making it was that we were doing a tribute record, and uh, we were not. We never were. We, um, Rich intended this record to be ten songs about Jesus. It was a, an exploration of faith, a meditation on the mind of Christ, uh, intended to provoke a certain response out of us and out of himself and hopefully out of the listener, because Rich was worked from the inside out, unlike a lot of... Christian musicians who are more like politicians. They work, they'll tell people what they think they want to hear. And that's why it was effective, I believe. And uh, we stuck to that with the, with the making of the record. We did want to honor our friend, and we hope we did by doing a good job on it. But this record is about Christ, and it is intended to draw the listener and, and ourselves closer to Christ through listening to it. Um, so that really, in a nutshell, is if I could clear up a misconception or and summarize our goal for the record, that was it. So, what you're saying is, just clear this up for me. Sure. What involvement did you guys have in songwriting? Did Rich write all the songs? Well, Rich came to us, he, you know, the idea had been, uh, you know, 
on the table for a couple of years. He had picked Man of No Reputation, a song I'd written a number of years ago and wanted to do it. He picked a song Mark and Beaker wrote. Uh, his original idea was that, that you know, we would each sing two songs and write two songs, and, and that included himself, and we just sort of went, you know, time out. That's probably a bad idea. I don't think anybody buys a Rich Mullins record to hear me singing off key, you know. No pun intended. <laughs> but... <laughs> Your last name. I'm telling you, that's my key, last, your last name. name. See, so you see what I did there? See, ladies and gentlemen, I t I, they should leave this to the professionals, the humor part of this. You see what I'm saying? <laughs> I, warned them, amateur, they, I warned them about this before the show, but they did not take me seriously. Uh, okay. Uh, what was I saying? Mark? Something really good. But you know, I want yeah. to ask you something. Now, this is a serious note, and it's difficult for me to be serious, but wasn't it, was this a emotionally hard record to make because you know when you're in the studio you're there for a long time and you're you're really developing the music is emotional you know and this came at a really very difficult time I'm guessing that it was almost impossible to do this well we counted the cost before we did it when Rich's family and his foundation and his label approached us about going ahead with the record a couple of weeks after he had died we um, you know, we knew that we were going to have to roll our sleeves up. A record doesn't just appear out of nowhere. And it's a lot of hard work. Yes, it was emotional, but I, I should say that it was also uh, a, a good and joyous experience. And it was uh, cathartic emotionally. And that helped to prompt us to go out on the road and see if anybody would come out and see it. Because we felt that there were a lot of people out there that still uh, wanted the opportunity to say goodbye or work it out for themselves, and we've been happy to be able to do that. So you're on tour now? We are. Tell me about the tour. It's going great. Uh, you know, we didn't know if anybody would buy the record, and we didn't know if anybody would come out on the tour. I mean, we're the ragamuffin band. We're not rich. You know? Yeah, but you know, I, look, you're being too humble because, guys, you're, in, you're what I call a band's band because you have some of the musicians that I've known about for a long time and really respected. And let me just tell a little story about you that you don't know. I'm, I'm part of a recording studio. Well, it's nothing terrible. Okay. His eyes got really yeah. big there for All a minute. Like, just oh my, my gosh, how, how did he know about that? But uh, I go out and I just buy, you know, 10, 20 records at a time. And we sit in the recording studio. And this is kind of a glaring admission. And we just kind of listen to him and we think, Man, what makes that great? Boy, isn't that awesome? Boy, we've got to do that on our next record. This is so cool, you know? And, uh, you know, you want people to think everything's original, but it's not. We're borrowing. But someone brought your solo project in, one that you recorded about a year ago, and it just was unbelievable. So you're, you're truly, a, what's the name of the solo project? Just it, it, it was named after its time on the shelves in the, most of the stores. It was called Blank. Blank. <laughs> Well, After it came out, I thought of calling it drink. Because <laughs> it went well, right Just kidding. It went right Milk. down, right? I, um, well, I was the guy that bought it in Memphis. Thank you. And it Thank was, you. Boy, you're very kind. You're too kind. We, you're my fan in Memphis. We, we, no, I'm playing for listen, you, man. That's, a, that's, a, that's an extremely fine record. You need to go and pick it up. Now, one more thing bef uh, before we go back to music. I noticed that you're a compassion artist. Right? Absolutely. I'm a compassion artist, and so briefly, tell me a little bit about that. Mark, why don't you start? We've been doing it, man, off and on since 90, 89, something like that. And I, I used to play in Rick's band, and that's how I met Rich. And we were uh, working for Compassion International. And uh, I don't know why, we kind of fell off with it for a while. And, uh, and then somehow we got approached to do the Native American focus on the USA Ministries of Compassion. For some reason, it just clicked with me that, yeah, we should do this. And uh, this train, my other band, got real involved with that. And I started spending about two months a year uh, uh, kind of devoting time to uh, Native American missions work. And there's, now it's branched out into the inner city oh, yeah? projects, a rural Mississippi project. It's uh, urban Chicago. It's uh, it's just unbelievable, and it's and you get to see it happen right in your own backyard. Oh, that's so cool! Yeah. I love to see musicians get involved with you know ministry projects like that. Um, I'm sure. Have you guys been on any of the trips with them overseas or anything oh, like yeah. that? Yeah, I've been to Guatemala twice, and it should be noted that Rit, this is so important, Rich, oh, yeah. and, and we wanted to be able to do something very, very uh, long-lasting to impact somebody's life with this tour, and that's been a wonderful thing you to guys, do. Um, you guys have got some peculiar instruments back here. I noticed a, the big one back there, I don't know if you can see it in the dark, but it's called a hammer dulcimer. Right. 
And that's kind of, what is that, like an Appalachian kind of vibe? Uh, um, just a peculiar instrument, isn't it? Yeah, I actually, I think the dulcimers originally, and Michael would probably uh, argue this, and I think it's originally in Syrian, Syrian, Syrian. origin, but it was taken over by the Appalachian tribes, okay. the Appalachian tribes. So are you telling me we're going to take a break before we introduce Mitch? Okay. So ladies and gentlemen, we are going to take a brief break, and then we're going to come back with Mitch McVicker and... and the Kid Brothers. And the Kid Brothers. All right, great. Can't wait. Now you're getting in their time. In addition to the Ragamuffin Band, ladies and gentlemen, we have an added pleasure for you tonight. Mitch McVicker and the Kid Brothers. Please make them welcome. Well, the Ragamuffins have let me uh, on this too, and so they're going to let me do a song, and so I want to do a stupid little song called the Lemonade Song. singing songs and humming on him tunes Though he never set foot in a church on Sunday morning The smile on his face looking out of place from the looks of his shirt and shoes Made me wonder what it was that kept him going Spent most of his lonely young days working downtown in the sawmill And a childhood is something he'd never known All the extra time he had on his mind every now and then his heart would spill and he starts singing all the way home And he'd sing, I, I don't know much But I know I love And one day I'll be sitting up in heaven on an easy chair Sipping lemonade, love lives there Round about that time the bells chimed and the church doors flew open And a whole herd of saints came running along Jim's way Talking about salvation, hope, and love, and everything else they didn't know about. And when they saw Jim, all of that changed. Now it takes a special kind of man to avoid a confrontation. And everywhere Jimmy looked, he had nowhere to go. They started throwing out names, throwing punches, and throwing laughter. And when they were through, blood was dripping from his nose. But he sang, I, I've heard about blood. I think it stands for love And one day I'll be sitting up in heaven On an easy chair sipping lemonade Love lives there Out of him and wouldn't hear nothing different. The moral to the story is he just keeps on keeping on. Now he ain't whitewashed, you won't find him on the corner praying. He just knows his love and knows his song, and he sings, I, I've got all I want. Cause I've got my love. I'll be sitting up in heaven on an easy chair Sipping lemonade, love lives there Yeah, one day I'll be sitting up in heaven on an easy chair Sipping lemonade, love lives there Yeah, one day I'll be sitting up in heaven on an easy chair Sipping lemonade Yeah, love lives there Your help. Lord, 
Lord, you're leading me. Lord, you're leading me. With a cloud by day. With a cloud by day. And then in the night. And then in the night. The glow of a burning flame. The glow of a burning flame. Everywhere I go, I see you. Suffered on the pontius pilot. He 
was crucified and dead and buried And I believe what I believe So what makes me what I am Well, I could not make it No, it is making me It is the very truth of God And not the invention of any man That he who suffered was crucified, buried, and dead. And he descended into hell, and on the third day he rose again. And he descended into heaven, where he sits at God's mighty right hand. And I believe that he's returning. To judge the quick and the dead and the sons of men But I believe what I believe Is what makes me what I am Well, I did not make it No, it is making me It's the very truth of God And not the invention of any man I promised you we bring you nothing but the best, don't we? This has been great tonight. Guys, thanks for being my guest tonight. Really been a wonderful treat for me tonight. And guys, let's lift them up in prayer as we go home tonight. They're going to be on tour. And I just have one small favor I want to ask. Could you play Awesome God? Would that be okay? 
Uh, yeah, I think we can. All right, Ragamuffin Band! Thank you. 